Brother Bubba Johns, would you come on up? His real name is Hilton, but they, this is his nickname. <laughs> I think the last time we had you here, it fell out on Past Appreciation Day because I didn't know, but they threw a dinner. Do you remember that? I remember that. Yeah. But it was a good dinner. It was a good dinner. I remember how delicious it was. Amen? So y'all need to do that again. <laughs> Simple as that. Amen. You got it, brother. Thank you, brother. All right. All right. Good morning. It is an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to just get this out of the way at the beginning. I cry. I'm a crier. So it's like when the tears start coming, I don't have the gift to speak through tears. So it's like I'm, I'm a big guy. I cry. My name is Bubba. It's like get over it. Literally, we're going to just get out of the way at the beginning. So um, a lot of you may actually know my wife better. Christine, can you come on up here with me? Amen. So, yep. So my wife and I, we are U.S. missionaries with Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship, and we are serving at the University of New Orleans. Today is not a support message for missions, uh, that's, but I do want, because this church, you guys have supported us, and y'all have been faithful to the call God has placed on us for years. This is my wife's 13th year serving at UNO. This is my seventh, or my eighth year. We're seven and a half, I'm seven and a half years into it. Um, yeah, time flies. I got three kids now, which is crazy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them here in a minute. But um, So I would actually, since you guys have supported us for so long, I would like, Christine, just to greet you guys and give you all a quick campus update just before we get into the Word. Well, I just want to say um, we love coming here. We're so grateful for you guys. Um, just because it's like the missions wall is almost overwhelming. You really, really care about people hearing the message of Jesus. And you really care about lives being transformed. And so um, just a quick story. This past year, we met a student named Jordan. Um, Jordan is from Slidell, um, but he grew up Jehovah's Witness. And so he, but you know how sometimes God places you in really interesting places. He kept driving. Christians in Jordan's life. And so there were people, he goes to UNO, um, which is where we serve as campus missionaries. And what we do there is we try to make it really, really easy for students to hear the gospel. We have a worship service on campus, so they don't have to go anywhere. We have life groups, which are Bible studies that take place in the dorms. Um, we have events and we do outreach on campus just so that we want God to be dropped on as many people's radars as possibly can. And so Jordan was one of those students. So he's working at Smoothie King. Well, one of our students works at Smoothie King. And they're like, Jordan, you should really come with me to this worship service with Chi Alpha. He's like, no, thanks. I don't really like preachers. Another person in his life is like, hey, Jordan, have you heard of Chi Alpha? You should really come to this worship service. And he's like, what is the deal? He's like, no, I don't really like, I don't really like preachers. So the third time was the straw that broke the camel's back. So a third different student meets Jordan. And he's getting to know him, having conversation. He's like, hey, you should join my life group. And he's like, that sounds pretty good. I'll do that. So he comes to life group, and then he hears about our worship service that happens on campus. And he's like, I don't know if this is a sign or what, but I guess I'm going to go. So he came last semester. And he's hearing the message of God. All of this is new to him um, because, like I said, he grew up Jehovah's Witness. And so he's, he's listening and he's processing through life group and with his life group leader. Well, at our very last worship service last semester, we didn't even preach the gospel. We had a moment, we had a time of, well, we did preach the gospel, but it was musical worship and testimony sharing, just people sharing what God has done all semester. And then at the end, we gave an altar call, and so we shared the gospel, um, and Jordan raised his hand to accept Jesus into his heart. And so <clears throat> it's been so exciting. He came with us um, to our, our winter retreat called SALT, and there um, I saw him in passing, and I'm like, hey, Jordan, how's, like, I know you're pretty new at this. Like, how, are you, how are you doing? And he's like, well, I've never heard about the Holy Spirit. Can you tell me about the Holy Spirit? As we're like in an elevator. And I'm like, that's a really great question. He's like, I never grew up you know, hearing about this. And so there was a class specifically where Jordan got to go and hear about the Holy Spirit, about the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he's just getting deeper, deeper, and deeper and deeper into a relationship with Jesus. And so that's just one of those things. I know you guys do offering, but you don't get to see the faces and you don't get to hear the names. And so it's just a joy for us to let you know that it really does matter and that there are people's hearts who are being changed. So just thank you so much. And we love and appreciate you guys. Yeah, God is good. 
It was actually, uh, I think I fed into the him not liking preachers thing, because before that last service, um, the first time that he came, we were preaching, and eyes closed, you know, if you want to make a decision for Jesus, and he kind of did this, and I don't accept that. When you come to know Jesus, it's like, yes. So we talked to him afterwards, and it's like the people that were in his life, I told them, and they talked to him afterwards, and when it was time, I mean, it was like, yes, I'm making the decision. I'm not kind of... You're here, you're testing already. You're tasting to see if the Lord is good. But when you made the decision, you made the decision. That's one of the reasons why I'm glad I'm here today. Y'all, I am glad, I'm happy to be here. I don't know if any, I mean, maybe a couple of the guys here in the back row, y'all were forced to come because your, your parents made you, you know. <laughs> but I think everybody else, like, we're here because we want to be here. We're here because we have an expectation to hear something from the Lord. You know, and something I, I want to bring, this, so one of our worship songs this morning it was talking about going in to that holy place, the holy of holies. So it's something that's really cool. Whenever you go, whenever they, they had the tabernacle, no artificial, no light was allowed in the tabernacle except for the light that came from the menorah. That was it. And the menorah, I don't think I had a really good understanding of what this was. No, I was, I was always, this candlestick. I'm thinking like, no, there's, there's these wax candles in it. Well, it wasn't. This is an oil burning lamp. It had, to be, it had to be constantly cared for, constantly refilled. The wicks had to be trimmed, constant maintenance. That light, that fire, that oil, that represents the Holy Spirit all through the Bible. All through the Bible, we cannot even see into the holy place without first the Holy Spirit illuminating it for us. So today, as, even as you guys, as we're moving forward in 2023, I'm hoping that this message today will be something the Holy Spirit allows to just put some more oil into that lamp. To light up what it is. Because y'all, every bit of that, that is intentionality on our part. We have to be intentional with what we do. This isn't a lackadaisical, you don't come into this haphazardly. No, you have to be intentional with your relationship with Jesus. If you're just like, if you're on autopilot, you're going the wrong way. There's no autopilot in this. You spend time with Jesus. You spend time in the Father's presence. You allow the Holy Spirit to give you direction. You willingly participate. He operates. We cooperate with him. That's how this works. So I'm hoping today this message makes a little bit of sense. Um, I say that because, y'all, I'm, I'm a bubba. A lot of things I say don't make sense. The fact that the Lord has allowed me to speak, to preach, Yo, that is nothing but testament to how good he is. Because this, by no stretch of the word or the imagination, should I be able to be up here and declare his goodness except for what he has done. So if you, y'all met my wife, um, I think some of y'all saw my kids. That is, uh, my oldest is Evelyn. So we kinda, it's kind of funny. My and Christine's first date, we went, we got hot wings. Found out she likes spicy things, so I, I call her pepper every once in a while. Well, since we've had kids, we've kind of kept that trend going. So if you were to... For me to tell you a little bit about my kids' personalities, all right? So Evelyn, she is more like Tony Satchery's, all right? She's just a good blend of all kinds of stuff. Not too hot, but no, just, I mean, she's just a fun little kid. My son, Timothy, he's more like pepper jelly. You know, he's sweet, but man, he can, he can light you up if you're not careful. I mean, he's, he's kind of like that sweet and sour kid, you know? It's like, you know, the sweet and sour... Uh, the sa- yeah, Sweet Sour Patch Kids. You no, know, it's like the commercials. They'll knock your hand out from under you, get you in trouble with the teacher, and then, you know, then they'll give you the answer. That's kind of him. And my, my, my youngest, Hannah, she's sweet. She is, but she's sriracha. She, there's so much fire in that little girl. She is the fieriest one. She's the most determined. The mo- I mean, she's, I'm wondering what she is going to be for the Lord because all three of them are special all three of them are unique. We love them dearly. And they actually minister with us on campus. There are people that we get to have conversations with. I mean, y'all heard Hannah this morning. I mean, they said amen. She said, amen. You no, know, it's like, I think that was actually um, my oldest, Evelyn's. I think that was her first word was amen. You know, and it, it's just amazing seeing these guys grow. But you know, life is full of questions. Am I right? It's full of questions. The older you get, the questions change. Your seasons of life, questions change. I mean, it's like, are you hungry? You know, most of us will be like, yes. Well, what do you want to eat? What do you want to do tonight? 
What are you doing after graduation? That's a question you guys are getting ready to start hearing a lot of in the back. Our students, they hear that a lot. What are you going to do after graduation? In the last two weeks, have you experienced any flu-like symptoms? In the last two weeks, have you encountered anyone that's tested positive for COVID? Are you currently awaiting any results for any test right now? Are you getting that vaccine? Some of them are a little more endearing, you know. We be my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. That was probably actually the hardest one to ask. Then it gets to, will you marry me? It's like, there's some, something riding on that one. <laughs> then, and then the questions change a little bit, right? Do you know how fast you're going right now? It's like, did you just miss our exit? <laughs> then, you start, then you start having children. It's like, are you waking up with the kids tonight? Or is it my turn? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's like questions. It's like there's questions everywhere. And this morning, I want us to concentrate and look at one question. There's one question we're going to be asking. That I mean, we'll probably be asking a couple of questions. But there's one question that we're going to hone in on. It's a question that the disciples asked Jesus. You know, this is a powerful question. Man, I mean, to me, it's powerful. Do you ever, have you ever had like a moment with with God? Like you're reading, you're praying, and it's like you see something in Scripture, and it, it comes alive to you, and it's like this is a life verse for me. Like this has transitioned to everything about how I walk, how I live my life, how I encounter scripture. That's what this verse was to me. I've been asking myself this question for the last couple of years. So it's a question that I believe can set each of us up to being the best all around follower of Christ we can be. That says a lot about one question, doesn't it? If we understand and we ask this question, it can help set us up to be the best follower of Christ that we can be. There's a lot riding on that. So there's one question. When asked with humility and surrender to the Lord, can help to give us a perspective into our lives that opens us up to better understanding the voice of God. This question, when asked while reading scripture, has the potential to open us up to understand doctrine, correction, and instruction that most of us want that helps leads us unto righteousness that we're longing for. This one question, I'll get to it in a minute, Pastor. I'll get to it. When asked while reading scripture, like the passages on love in 1 Corinthians 13, it has a revealing nature that can spur change. Changing our attitudes and our intentions. It even helps steer our understanding to what true love means. When asked along Galatians 5, with the fruit of the Spirit, when we ask this question, it illuminates our, the progress of our character that the Holy Spirit is trying to bring us into, or it uncovers the truth that we're not as far along as we thought we were. You ready for it? Okay. So I've been asking this question, like I said, for a couple of years. Um, and I ask this question like when I read things like the parables of Jesus. You know, when I read the parables of Jesus and I hear him say things like, he's talking about the different types of people, some self-righteous, some humble. As I hear him talk about the hearts of different people that are, are, are like soil prepared to receive the word, I ask this question of each person that's mentioned. I ask it as I hear him explain who will and will not enter the kingdom of God. Or as Jesus tells about the man that was robbed and passed by, passed over by two religious people, intended to by a stranger, and then left in the hand of an innkeeper. Do you ever read scripture and like take a side? You know, it's like, you, you read, it's like, oh, <laughs> I'm this guy. I'm following him, you know, but it, 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 I, I do that. It, real quick, if you've never actually, like, picked one of the disciples or someone in the Bible that's holy and righteous, like, followed their whole story, you know, that is a really cool way to let the Bible disciple you. Following someone's character arc in the Bible, it's like, this is where they started. This is everything that they went through, and then this is how God used them. Like, I've done it with Joshua, and that's an amazing study. Like, studying that one person, how God spoke to him, what he brought them out of, and how he used them. It's a powerful way to do it. But you need to do that intentionally. If you're ever just reading scripture, and you all of a sudden, it's like you start taking sides, or you're focusing on one person, you, know, you may very well be missing something the Holy Spirit is trying to show you. This question can help you not do that. All right. Y'all ready? Okay, I did not create the question. I told you that. The first time I hear it, it was asked by the disciples when Jesus gave them some heartbreaking news. He says, one of you will betray me. And man, so where we're going, 
is Matthew 26, verse 20 through 22. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. If anybody is wanting to know which, where this is coming from. Verse 20 through 22. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? Heavenly Father, we bring this to you. Father, we ask that you will illuminate this for us today. As we examine this question, is it I, Lord? Use it to reveal, Lord God, where it is and where it isn't. Bring us, Lord God, today to a place of confrontation with Scripture, with your word, not man's. Change our hearts. Show us, Lord God, how to add oil to the lamp. And use this, Lord God, as we move forward into this year. We glorify you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're asking the question, is it I, Lord? Something I want to bring attention to real quick. Whenever we read Matthew's account, his account is different than what you would hear in John. We don't hear any of the disciples pointing fingers, or making accusations, or saying, hey, he's talking about you. Each and every one of them made it very personal. Is it I, Lord? I want us to take that, and I want us to hold things in. I don't want, as we're going through this scripture today, I don't want us to think of anyone else that the Lord might be trying to talk to. And we say, oh, no, that's, that's for my brother. Man, I wish my brother was here today. Say, like, man, I wish my sister was here. Man, my daddy needs to hear this one. You know? I, I, I don't want that. What I'm asking us to do is like, I don't want us to point fingers. I don't want us to make accusations. I don't want us to look to anything else, but I want us to hear this as if the Lord is speaking to you. What is he saying to you this morning? Can we do that? Is it I, Lord? Before we go, we're going to come back to this very passage of scripture. But before we do that, I want us to go on a little trip, all right? So imagine this is the Matthew 26, verse 20 to 25 right here. This is where we're coming back to, all right? We're going to get on a little bus. We're going to go. We're going to visit the Gospel of Luke for a couple of minutes. No, then we're going to make our way back around here. So if y'all would, let, let, let's take this little trip. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. And I want to talk about a parable that I've preached, that I've heard preached. But in the light of this question, the context of it changed. And it's, it's a very, it's, well, let's say, it's weird whenever we say, oh, it's a popular verse that Jesus said. Like, isn't all of it popular? I mean, we hear all of it at one point. It's all pretty, it's all important. Where we're going is Luke chapter 18. We're Luke chapter 18. We're going to begin with verse 9. And in verse 9, we're introduced to two men. We're not given their names. We're not, one is identified by his religious beliefs, the other one by his occupation. So what we see right here is a Pharisee and a tax collector go to church. We see them praying, and Jesus gives us some insight into them. So Luke 18, verses 9 through 14 is where we're going to be reading. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and, tr and treated others with contempt. Two men... Went up, went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. How many times have I heard this message and left thinking, man, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee. Whoo, that self-righteous jerk. My goodness. When that thinking is exactly like the thinking of the Pharisee. I've been that Pharisee. It breaks my heart to think that how long have I sat there in that very place? 
And this is a parable. This man doesn't really even exist. This is a story Jesus is teaching, but I am just like him, casting judgment on someone that is casting judgment on someone else. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? When we hear the word speak against something, such as those who trust in themselves and treat others with contempt, did we ever go back to the very beginning of the parable? Let's go back there. Jesus is speaking to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. Is it I, Lord? Do I believe in my righteousness? Is there something about me that is treating others with contempt? We've got to remember where the parable starts. We get into the parable and we want to stay there and like what is the lesson of the parable saying? But it's like, what is the parable teaching from the point that it started? Other people, y'all may do better with that, but for me, I get into the parable, and I'm, I'm looking at the parable, but I often forget what Jesus is actually addressing with the parable. How many times have I been self-righteous, trusted in my own righteousness, looked down on other people, when God is longing and looking for that person, that tax collector? It says that the Pharisee was standing by himself. It's almost like he's up front, Right there by himself talking, but it says the tax collector is far off. He's far off, and it says he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. What is God looking for in this passage? What is he asking of us? Is my heart lined up with that of the tax collector? Desiring, begging, in need of mercy from God. Yo, that should be every one of us. Our righteousness is as that of filthy rags. There is none righteous, not one. Who are we to think, oh, I'm good. I got it. No. Lord, have mercy on me. I've been ordained now for a few years. Been following Jesus since 2005. But Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. None of us have made it. We're not there yet. God is still changing us. We move from glory to glory, from one moment to the next. And it's like, Lord, go ahead and take me. Go ahead, please. Like, but he's not ready to take us because he's got more for us. Not just more for us to do. He's got more for us to change into. More of his image for us to change into. We make it all. Oh, it's the mission. It's the work. It's the work. It's the work. The work is done in you. When the work is done in you, the work outside takes place. It's not even part of the message, but y'all, it's true. Y'all, the question, is it I, Lord, can be powerfully illuminating. And it's not simply a question we ask, is it I? We're not just asking the question, is it I? It's a question that we are laying before the Lord. Is it I, Lord? This isn't an introspective thing. It's not a personal, philosophical, or intellectual intrigue we're trying to answer. But this is an act of spiritual submission in which we are opening ourselves up to hear from the Lord. And then we wait and allow the Holy Spirit to answer. Is it I, Lord? When we look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, let's stay in Luke. Let's go to chapter 10. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Here we find Jesus being tested by a lawyer. He's being tested by a lawyer. So Luke 10 verses 25 through 27. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus goes on to say, well, there's a man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's robbed. He's beaten. We see a priest passing by, a temple worker passing by. Then we see a Samaritan, considered a half-breed outcast from Jewish society. Tend to his wounds. Take care of him. Then continue his provision. We see the innkeeper providing continual care of the man. So where are you in the story? 
Is it I, Lord? Let's ask that question. Is it I, Lord? Am I the one that's been beaten and robbed? Or sometimes that may very well be true. It might be you, the one that's been beaten and robbed, that needs someone to come and tend to. But all you see is people passing you by, these religious people, and you're casting judgment on them because that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be taking care of me. But God is going to use someone else to show you his character, his true character. If you're in that place, my sister, my brother, wait. Be patient because he is coming to tend to you. So are you the one that's been beaten and robbed? Lord, is it I? Am I the robber? Am I the robber? Am I one of the religious people that have, for whatever reason, passed by someone that I know I can and should help? Or have I simply been blinded by the overwhelming needs around me that I no longer see those in need? Am I the Samaritan? Am I the helper and the caretaker of those fallen at the hands of others? Not even the ones that I've wronged. Those fallen at the hands of others. Am I the innkeeper? Am I hosting and continuing to help heal those that need care? Or is it I, Lord? Am I the lawyer? Am I testing Jesus and desiring to justify myself? You know, it's so easy as to forget what brought us to the lesson in the first place. How many times have we tried to test the Lord? How many times have we tried to justify ourselves? Oh, Lord, it's okay if I drink, isn't it? Lord, I mean, as a believer, I, I have the right to do these things. I can do this. Yeah, we lay every one of our rights down at the feet of Jesus. Let me tell you a real quick testimony. We fight for our rights as believers in this state, in, the, in this nation. We can do this. If you tell me I can't do this, that's legalism. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about where's your heart? We're in Kenya, so some of y'all might have seen this. Like, I, lo I love going to Kenya. I love traveling. I don't know if y'all know the Cheshires, um, but I love going over there with, with Mikey, with Brother Mike and uh, Sister Marigold. We go to this village, and this village is one of the bi biggest ones that we've been to. You know, it was really it was kind of an amazing moment that we had men, we had women, children. We had everybody there at one time. <clears throat> we tell the story of creation all the way to Jesus. How God has, tried, has, God has walked with Adam and Eve. How he talked with Moses. How he still desires to have a relationship with us. And that's where Jesus comes from. We're telling the story that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again and he's coming back. Then we pray for healings. For signs and wonders. We've, I, I can sit up here for, for a long time and tell you the miracles that I've seen happen. I've seen blinded eyes open. One of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. It was so weird. But so beautiful. It was amazing. This face was one of the first faces this guy has seen that had been blind for years. Like, I'm sorry. The Lord does love you. <laughs> there are other people to look at. But in this village, while we're there, it, it's, we, we did not preach you have to let things go. We preached Jesus Christ crucified, risen again. He, it, it is, we didn't say, hey, you have to stop doing this, 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 and this. We didn't give them a list of the rules. That comes, that comes later. You know? It's like, they say, hey, whoever you guys are, we're giving you all this piece of land. We want you to have this. Build a church. Bring someone here to disciple us, to tell us more about this. We want to hear about it. And then the craziest thing happened. This lady comes up. and says, She's like the mother of the village. Like, she's, that literally says what she said whenever she comes up. The interpreter says, these are all my children. It was a big village. Well, she starts telling us, like, she has this medicine. And she's like, because of what you said and the healings that I've seen take place here today, I want you to take this medicine. I want you to burn it. I'm going to trust in Jesus. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I take it. I don't know what's in this. She gives me this, 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 this can. So I take it over and I build a fire real quick and I open it up. It was tobacco. This woman was trusting in tobacco. She would do it. It would get rid of her headaches. It would, there's different things that she would use it for. But because of Jesus, she willingly gave up something that we fight for a right to hold on to. As we're going back to the, to the truck, they come, they're, they're coming out of their bomas, their, their, little, their villages, and they're coming out with these bottles. 
They're just dumping them out. We didn't tell them to do this. We're like, what is that? And they say, oh, that's whiskey. They're dumping out all their alcohol because, they, because of what Jesus has just done for them. They're getting rid of these things. And we fight for our right to hold on to things when these people are hearing the name of Jesus. Willingly give this stuff up. Is it I, Lord? Am I trying to test you? Am I trying to justify myself because I want to hold on to something? Yo, this isn't me. This is scripture. This isn't me. This is truth that I have witnessed with my own eyes. Is it I, Lord? Yo, this parable is in response to someone trying to justify themselves to Jesus. And Jesus goes to the extreme of saying someone was beaten and robbed and left to die. And this man was just trying to justify himself. Do we try to justify ourselves? The answer to that question should almost always lead us back to a place of repentance. Because typically the answer is yes. Somewhere within this, even if it isn't this grand thing that I'm sinning with, somewhere within that there is a heart issue that, God, you're trying to deal with. If not, I don't believe I would be reading that in your word right now. There is something he's trying to get our attention to. Every time we open up the word, every time you read, he has something for you. If you have eyes to see and ears to listen, he is talking to us. He is speaking to us, but we need to listen to what he's saying. We have to ask the question, is it I, Lord? And we take a great risk at becoming the Pharisee from Luke 18, trusting in our own righteousness, our own self-righteous and religious pomp, oblivious to those God has called us to help. Or we can choose to be like the tax collector and humble ourselves and plead for mercy. And after we have received mercy from God, even while we are still receiving mercy, we must continue to ask the question, is it I, Lord, when we're confronted with Scripture? Was continue even while you're receiving, even while the change is happening, while, while you, man, Lord, I'm hurt. Well, so are they. I'm healing you. Now be a vessel of healing for them. That's missional. That's allowing the change inside of you to be the change that God is wanting us to do to show people his kingdom. Jesus came declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's showing that through each and every one of us. And that change he's bringing up inside of each and every one of us is declaring to the world that he is real, that he is good, and that he loves them. So let's give one more example of what it looks like to ask this question as you're reading scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. So this question that the disciples asked of our Lord, you know, can take the simple action of reading scripture to being confronted by it. There's sometimes we read and it's like, and intentionally we kind of skip over it because it's like, ah, that's a little too hard. I don't really want to have to deal with what's being said right here, but we're going to do it anyway today. All right, so here we go. So I told y'all we're going to swing back around to Matthew. So not Matthew 26, we're going to Matthew 25. I hate it when pastors preach from this passage. Can't stand it. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Long passage, right? Matthew 25. 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Real quick. Actually, I'll come back to it. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when do we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer him. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Y'all realize hell wasn't prepared for you? It wasn't made for you. It wasn't made for me. 
It was made for something completely different. But humans, mankind, made in the image of God, when we defy God, when we walk the other way, God is not throwing us into hell. We are willingly walking into it. He has decreed what is right. He has told us what is good. To love mercy, do justice, to walk humbly with our God. He's told us what to do. But because of our disobedience, we are walking there. He's not throwing anybody into it. He's shown you the way. He's given us the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through Jesus, but we turn from him. So when we have this image that God is going to throw people there, it's like, no. You're doing it yourself. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Is it I, Lord? If you do not ask the question with honesty and sincerity, you, you won't know. With a cursory read, it's easy to read over and think, man, I sure hope I end up on the right side. Why not ask that question, is it I, Lord, then alleviate the doubt? Lord, am I feeding those that are hungry? Am I giving drink to those who are thirsty? Am I clothing those who are naked? Am I visiting those who are in prison? Am I doing these things? If he, he's giving us a list right here. He, he's literally, he's giving us a list. Why in the world would we not regard that as holy? As something to do? As like, th like these are my marching orders. Why would we disregard that? Because it's hard. Because it's not easy. Because that selfless because that is looking to the needs of others when we look to the needs of ourselves. Y'all, it's a hard word, but it's not mine. This is, this is Jesus speaking here. These are his words here. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? So you can't actually ask this question with the wrong motives. You can. You can ask it with the wrong motives. Um, the same night that the other disciples asked this question of Jesus, is it I, Lord? Let's not forget Judas was there. But he didn't ask the same question. He asked a different question. Let me show you. Let's go back to Matthew 26. Read verses 20 through 25. Read verses 20 through 25. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful. Did you hear that? They were very sorrowful. His words affected them. They were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Is it I, Rabbi? Let's take a look, like, real quick at what these words mean. The question that the eleven asked, Is it I, Lord? That word, Lord, I am not a Greek scholar. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to act like I know what this meant. Like, I had to look it up, and I'm not even going to pronounce the word right, I'm sure. It's, it looks like it's pronounced kurios, that word Lord. And the definition for that is the one who I belong to and has power over my decisions, my master. It also is a title of honor, ex expressive of respect and reverence from servant to master. But it is also the title given to God, the Messiah. These guys answered with a lot of respect humbling themselves to the place of a servant. Moved with sorrow, they asked, my God, my Messiah, is it me? 
You said one of us will betray you. That I am one of us. Is, is it, am I the one that's going to betray you? Yo, that's a heart that God can use. That is a heart that loves God. But then you see Judas' response with rabbi. Is it I, rabbi? It does mean my great and honorable sir. It's a title used by Jews to express, to, to address their teachers. But what we see here is we see two things. We see servant to master and we see pupil to teacher. A pupil can one day become a teacher. A pupil could one day enter into a place of equal rank with a teacher. We never enter the same place as God. Jesus is always above us. We are always below. He is always master. We are brothers with Christ, but he is always God. He is always Jesus, Lord and master. The 11 asked the question from a place of intense love. Judas from a place of self-righteousness, personal ambition. What, like there's, there's so many different things you could put from where he asked from. But how are you going to respond to this message today? How are you going to respond? Are you going to look at Jesus simply for instruction? Or are you going to be submitted to him? Is he simply a wise person to learn from? Or is he God Almighty to whom all honor and respect must be given out of willing obedience and submission? Or are you simply going to be, are you reading the, the, the word for knowledge or for Bible bullets to shoot at unbelievers? The Pharisee shot Bible bullets. That's what he did. He said, Lord, I do what you tell me to do. I fast, I give, I do all this. I am righteous. This man, he's not. Send him to hell, Lord. I'm better than him. Is it I, Lord? Am I one of the goats or am I a sheep? You've literally showed me how I can answer that question. Where have I been the robber? Where have I been the lawyer trying to justify myself? Where have I tried to test you? Lord, where can I be the Samaritan? Where can I be the innkeeper? Is it I, Lord? As we prayerfully consider this question as we read scripture, we find that this question can lead us to repentance and that it should lead us to repentance. And y'all, repentance is a great thing. It's a great thing. Whenever we, somebody says, oh, you need to repent. Like, it, if, if you get tense and you want to like try to justify yourself and start fighting with somebody because who are you to tell me I need to repent? Well, you probably need to repent. Because <laughs> literally you are showing your heart in that moment. Like your heart is being revealed because of how you're responding to truth. He is calling us constantly to a place of repentance. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That turning from your wicked ways, by like seeking his face and turning from your wicked ways, that is repentance. And that's what we're called to do. This question helps lead us every day to repentance. That's not a bad word for a believer. We are called to repent. Is Jesus simply your teacher? He is our teacher. Please don't misunderstand that at all. But he is so much more. He's so much more than our teacher. The word tells us that we are to declare Jesus as Lord. We're not to declare him as rabbi. He is teacher. Lord is so much more. Master is something I can learn from always. Messiah God, I can learn from you always. I can look on you with adoration. I can adore you. I can, I can sit in awe and wonder of you always. Teacher, not always. God's word tells us that we are to declare him as Lord. He is always above, not equal. So this week, let's begin to ask the question, is it I, Lord? I would even recommend that read through Galatians 5. Read through Galatians 5 and ask the question alongside what says the works of the flesh are these things. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. 
as you get into these things, like, Lord, is it I? The work of the flesh, am I seeing this in my life anywhere? Then the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, am I walking in this? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. All of those things, I probably left one out. Is it I, Lord? Because, y'all, that question can illuminate our hearts if we ask it from a place of submission to him. You know, this morning we've looked at quickly just a few parables. Like just a couple of parables is all we've looked at. And I don't know this morning, has the Holy Spirit brought some level of conviction to you? Is there something that the Holy Spirit is trying to say? Maybe not even on, on what we talked about here, but has the question, is it I, Lord? Has it shown you something else about your character that God is trying to reveal to you, but you have just been holding back? Have you been trying to test God anywhere? Have you been trying to justify yourself anywhere? Let's let the Holy Spirit have a few moments to work in us this morning. Before we even leave can everyone just close your eyes with me for a few moments? Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, I see Judas and Peter both broken that same night by their actions. Judas, because he betrayed you. And Lord, that brokenness, it led to a torment that led him to kill himself. Peter's brokenness from denying you. Lord, his brokenness came from a place Lord, that still showed that he had a love for you, but he was flawed. And Lord, you restored him and used him the same as you've used me. And you were still willing to use me. The same as, Lord, as you were willing to use everyone here. Holy Spirit, I pray, reveal to us this morning what you want us to do. You want us to return to you. You want us to pray for each other, to lift each other up. You want us, Lord God, to keep moving forward. Lord, this year we cannot move forward unless we stop unless we make sure we're continuing to add oil to the lamp and we're asking the question as we read your word, is it I, Lord? Because, Lord, there may be some in here that aren't even reading your word. Lord, if that's the case, I pray, Lord, move them to that. Lord, if they can't read it, Lord, there's, there's ways to, to listen. I listen to your word as I drive Lord, there are ways to listen, but Father, I pray that you will move us to be in your words so that we can be confronted by your words. So many of us long to hear from you, but Lord, we're not positioning ourselves to hear. Father, show us how to position ourselves to hear from you. As we read and meditate on your word, as we pray to you, as we have conversations with holy people, not perfect people, Lord, because there are no perfect people, but holy people, people that are seeking you, that are humbling themselves before you, Father. I pray, let us hear your words. So this morning, as you guys stay in this place, is there anyone in here today that can, that can with, with a showing of hands, that can say, yes, this morning, I need to repent of something. The Holy Spirit has revealed that to me. Can I see your hands? I see your hands. I see your hands all over the place. You can put your hands down. 
Pastor, do y'all have times of prayer? Okay. Can I get everyone to stand with me? Y'all, there is no power here that is not at your seat. There's not. The Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is alive. The Holy Spirit can touch you there the same as he can here. But something that I see, when people move, when you make a step toward God, he runs to you. All across this house this morning, my brothers and my sisters in faith have said, yes, there's something I need to repent of. I'm going to ask you, will you take that step this morning? Will you come forward? Will you let this place, can we make an altar here this morning before God and repent this morning? And so let us, O oh Lord, work together and walk together in harmony and in unity, loving one another in the faith. So, Father, right now, we just, we just pray a blessing over Bubba and Christine. We just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would just bless them in every way, finance, health, Lord, and give them wisdom and training up their children in the way that they should go. We pray a blessing on those children that, Lord, every need that they might have, or even in the future, is definitely covered in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.